Well, hello, church. My name is Melissa Urich, and I'm on the staff team here at The Well, and I love being able to welcome you to our weekly online gatherings. You know, today we are wrapping up our mini teaching series that we called Unbelievable. And what it was and what it is, is a conversation between Vijay Krishnan, who's our lead pastor here at The Well, and his dad, Sundar Krishnan, who amongst other things, was the pastor of a large multi-ethnic church here in the greater Toronto area of Ontario, Canada, for many, many years. And the reason we wanted to listen to his story is because we, as we listened to how he grew up as um, a Hindu boy in India, made his way to North America to pursue an engineering degree at MIT and ultimately moved to Toronto, Ontario to work in nuclear engineering. Um, we get to see how God is actually using all of the gifts and talents and people and opportunities in Sundar's life to um, write a story that ultimately brought him into um, a deeper relationship with him. And actually, that's our story. We maybe didn't start off in India or certainly are not MIT graduates, but God is writing a unique story in your life. He is using the people and the places and the gifts and the talents and all of the things in your life to draw you into a deeper relationship with him and ultimately um, equipping you to live with purpose and, and um, meaning in your life. And so as you listen today um, to their conversation, as you pray and sing with us, um, you can actually ask God to show you what is the story that he is writing in your life. He wants to answer that. It actually says really clearly in the Bible that he does have a plan for you, that he knows you personally. In fact, he knit you together on purpose in your mom's womb, that you are fearfully and wonderfully made. In fact, he knows every hair on your head. And so you can ask him, God, what is it that you want to do in and through me um, in this life? And so that's our hope for you today. The other thing I wanted to mention is that today is Palm Sunday. Palm Sunday marks the beginning of Holy Week, the week leading up to Good Friday and Easter Sunday. This is it, friends. This is the week. If you are a follower of Jesus, this is what um, our whole faith is all based on. And today marks Palm Sunday. This is the day that Jesus entered into Jerusalem, um, perceived to be a revolutionary, uh, maybe even a conquering king. Um, the people, the, the Hebrew people who were living under the oppression of Rome, of like an occupying um, nation in their land, were so excited that Jesus was finally there, that he was going to come into Jerusalem and he was going to like knock over the establishment. And so um, the story of what happened on Palm Sunday is actually found in the four biographies of Jesus. You can find that in your Bible, actually. In, in the first four books of the New Testament, they're called Matthew and Mark, Luke and John. You can read about how Jesus rode in on a donkey and how the people um, put palm branches on the ground, almost like a carpet, like, like a red carpet, except I guess it would be green, a carpet for him um, to enter in on. And that they waved these palm branches shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest, basically saying, Jesus, come, come, free us, save us. And then over the course of Holy Week, we understand that Jesus was a revolutionary, that he was coming to free us, that it would look different than what we thought, and that in fact his revolution was gonna be gonna begin with his death on the cross. And so we are excited um, to invite you into a week where you get to contemplate and actually saturate your hearts and your minds in the miracle and the majesty of Easter. You know, we have um daily readings that ha that we post on our website um, every morning that will help you prepare your heart and your mind for Easter weekend. But maybe you have your own devotional, something that you do or you read, or maybe you just want to read through um, one of the biographies of Jesus and read, start on Palm Sunday and go straight through until um, Good Friday. But however that is, we hope that this week will help you to be ready for all that we get to celebrate next week as we re um, remember and reflect on um the suffering of Jesus on our behalf, and we celebrate um, his triumph and his resurrection over death and sin on Easter Sunday. So with that, right now, I'm going to invite our worship team to come and to lead us. Welcome to the well. I cannot want to. I count on one thing The same God that never fails Will not fail me now You won't fail me now In the waiting The same God who's never late Is working all things out You're working all things out Oh yes, 
give us the courage and the strength to do that. God, in the middle of troubling times, in the middle of uncertain roads, trials, and hardships, God, give us the strength, God. We can't muster it up in our own strength. Give us the strength to praise you, Father, to reach out to you, to declare that you are still good. And God, say from the depths of our souls that yes, we will Yes, we will worship you in the middle of these storms. And God, if we are on the mountaintop today, if we are in a season of plenty, God, we want to continue to reach out to you and continue to praise you for your good. So we thank you, God, that whatever season we're in, God, circumstances do not change your goodness. We love you, God. We love to worship you. Thank you that you are perfect in all of your ways, God. In Jesus' name we pray. Hey, if you're joining us at the well, we're uh, glad you're here. Uh, just a heads up as we start into today's uh, interview and the conclusion to the Unbelievable series, we're talking about a pretty uh, weighty and a heavy matter, and that's about um, kind of leadership failures, both, both in and outside of the church and faith context. And we just uh, want to just prepare some of you for whom that might be a really difficult conversation because um, you have been a victim maybe of an abuse of power or abuse in general or uh, things that where people with power, faith leaders, you know, uh, failed and you were personally affected by that. Even some of us, many of us can say, yeah, our own faith uh, just in general gets rocked by that. And so we just want to be aware of that and that for some of you, this may be uh, a triggering conversation or something that brings up and you may have to watch it in small pieces or you may just want to have somebody that you're watching it with that you can process with or even if you want to reach out to one of us after that, but just wanted to give you the heads up for that and know that we're aware of that. We're praying for you in this um, and just wanted to give you a heads up as you prepare um, just to listen in on this conversation. 
Welcome to our last episode in mm -hmm. the four-week mini-series called Unbelievable. And we've been uh, taking a journey we're calling an unexpected, unlikely journey of faith through the story that I'm interviewing my dad, Sunder, um, and his life and his story. And uh, as we come to a close here, I think uh, I want to focus in on something that um, uh, is a pretty weighty topic, and, um, but one that I just feel like, and I felt like even as we were planning, it was just so important to talk about, and I wanted mm -hmm. to talk about it with you. Um, it's sad in the sense that it's, it's unbelievable because it's just come to be expected. Um, and that is just that uh, you, you actually told me this story. Here's the best way to describe what we're going to talk about. That a little while ago, you were speaking at a, at a conference. And the person who had brought you in was someone who had worked part-time with you at mm. the church where you retired from a few years ago. And when he went to introduce you as a group of uh, songwriters, artists, the way he introduced of all the things he could have introduced you for, he'd worked with you a number of years, you've been a pastor for many years, you've written books, you've spoken to different places or whatever, uh, anything of the things we mentioned even in the last few weeks about your story. Exactly. And what he said was, here's someone who finished 37 years of ministry without a scandal. Yeah. And it's a, you laugh a little and then you mostly cry right. with a statement like yeah. that, that sadly it's come to be expected that um, leaders uh, will fail and will fall. And not just, of course, we're all flawed, but that there will be some kind of scandal. And this is true in a sense, we're seeing this of both people of faith who are leaders in faith context, but people outside faith context in whatever form, whether it's mm -hmm. you know, um, any kind of industry or government or whatever, this just seems to be a thing. And I know that it's, it's hard to talk about, but I, here's why I wanted to, to talk about it today. One is that, um, well, I should say this. I do so with a bit of fear and trembling, and uh, I'm not being dramatic. I think partly because you and I are both, or we're both faith leaders. Mm. Um, neither of us are dead yet. Right. Neither of us are finished. Well, exactly. We're yeah. not finished yeah. yet. And so there's a way that we could talk about it that would directly or indirectly give the impression of we are masters over this subject uh, yeah. and we're talking about those bad people who fail in leadership. Right. So let's just off the top saying that's not at all mm. why. There's enough in it to scare me to keep my mouth shut to say, you know, I, I'm so scared of this even happening <laughs> in my life or whatever that would want me to stay away from it. But, but I think we need to talk about it because it isn't just a matter of bad people who do bad things and we can vilify them or villainize them or distance ourselves enough from them to say, well, I would never do that. Um, but we can't, and we need to talk about it because it's affecting all of us. Um, it's affecting all of us either who are in positions of any kind of leadership or let's say influence, which all of us have. Right. We are all exactly. connected to other people in whose lives we have influence, mm. whether we want to acknowledge it or not. Exactly. And our decisions do impact them. And I think for me as someone who still let's say I'm younger than you, even mm. if I'm not a young leader anymore. I want wisdom from those who have gone ahead of us mm -hmm. to say, these are the things that, you know, wisdom warns and encourages and instructs. And so um, I want to just have this conversation today, just recognizing mm -hmm. our limitations and even having it. Mm -hmm. We only know our own stories and our right, own experiences. Right. Mm -hmm. Limitations in terms of we do not want to uh, judge others in the sense of things we don't know or see. But at least still to say, okay, um, we need to talk about this mm -hmm. in the church as leaders, as people, as family members, as a younger person to someone who's less young <laughs> down the road. Mm. Um, so even just off the top, dad, like cards on the table, how do you feel about even talking? Like some of this just makes me so, uh, you know, the weight of it. Yeah. But also, how do you feel even coming into a conversation? Oh, like my that? goodness. You know, this morning, it's interesting, as I was praying and preparing my heart, all of a sudden, a chill kind of descended over me when I was preparing this one. It was almost like God was speaking, saying, you haven't finished yet, so be careful. Yeah. So what you are saying mm -hmm. was fresh this morning upon yeah. my heart. So I really do do it with fear and trembling. Yeah. That doesn't mean we can't talk about it because yeah. we want to give credit to God. Yeah. We don't want to undermine what He hasn't done. Yeah. But... 
He says, be careful, be careful. And uh, one of the phrases I love is the illusion of invincibility, you know. Yeah. And, so yeah. that phrase, uh, I have a spiritual director mm. who's a few years older than me, who you have kind of been a mentor to. Um, we met at kind of at different times. I joke with him that he, he basically uh, agreed to mentor me because he likes you. Um, <laughs> He said he was very disappointed one day when you went to a burger joint and he ordered, you ordered a veggie burger. He said that really, <laughs> but I still stayed learning from it. Yeah. But he said, he said he remembers studying at what is now Tyndale Seminary, but it was Ontario Bible College and right. Ontario Theological Seminary uh, a few decades ago. And it was around the time when some stories of Christian leaders who were failing, who were, um, you know, were caught sort of in affairs and money laundering and all that kind of stuff came out. And he, he, you were coming in, in a sense, to speak to a class of the stuff, and your opening line, he said, just floored us. He said, you said something like, beware of the illusion of invincibility. Right. Basically saying, we are all susceptible right. to um, things we would never dream we yeah, would do. Exactly, yeah. And my, my line uh, is that, that Nobody draws a straight line from where they are to a ditch right. and says, that's where I'm going. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah. You know, catastrophe, scandal, mm. affair. No one plans. Yeah. Um, and so there is this thing, I think, even when we think about it, first and foremost, there is wisdom, not only in caring for those who have been hurt or marginalized or abused or taken advantage in this, but then secondly, <laughs> quickly to begin to look inward right. and say, okay, yeah, there is this illusion of invincibility. How would you kind of unpack that a little yeah. bit more even well, as you think about yourself? I think, first of all, just have something to drive home that reality. Yeah. Stories do that so much better than concepts, right? Yeah. And I remember a story that Gordon MacDonald told in one of his books about uh, at the height of the Cold War between the U.S. and Russia, where they all had their anti-ballistic missiles and their defense systems against attacks and whatnot. A 19-year-old Scandinavian pilot, I think flying a one-engine plane, landed it right in the main square in the Kremlin at Red Square. How did he do that? You know, it was invincible. He flew under the radar. Mm. They were so prepared for the big things, yeah. they were not prepared at all for the under the radar stuff. Yeah. Wow. When I read that, I thought, oh, oh my goodness, oh my goodness. Mm. So I think... We need to just really, really not just give lip service to it, yeah. but to actually believe Jesus when he said, let him that thinks he stands yeah. take heed lest he fall. Yeah. And there is a, it doesn't mean that I look frighteningly over my shoulder and cower in paralyzing fear. Mm -hmm. That's just a healthy respect. Yeah. Like I'm not a good swimmer. Yeah. So when I'm on the edge of a large body of water, yeah. I'm very careful. Yeah. That kind of caution, yeah. I think is important. Yeah, it reminds me of um, someone commenting on how Jesus taught, you know. Um, he, on the one hand, um, you know, sobered up everyone who was listening by taking their attention off of the external behaviors to the heart. Right, exactly. Right, in one of the, maybe the most famous sermon Jesus had, the Sermon on the Mount, he said, okay, you've heard it said, don't commit adultery, mm. don't commit murder. But have you ever lusted at someone in your heart? Mm. Have you ever uh, been angry and hateful at someone in your heart? These are just as deadly. It was Jesus turning the attention, not that the behaviors don't matter, but there's something deeper always going on inside of us beyond the behaviors. And I think that's what's been sobering, but also really important for me. In this inward look, this reflection, and you talked about this even last week around um, beginning to look inside yourself and right. see what's going mm -hmm. on. That there, we may look at certain disasters and things and say, well, that would never happen to me or that could, but we don't realize there are antecedent conditions mm -hmm. and really of the heart that if we're not aware of, we actually have no way of knowing whether we will end up in a place we never thought we would. One of the conversations or the things that I say when I do premarital counseling with couples, say, I say to them, don't say, I'll never cheat on my spouse. Right. Yeah. Because what that is, is a statement of confidence in yourself and in your resolve, and which is good to say, I don't, you know, but that all that says is, I'm confident enough in myself that my own resolution is enough to secure me and in my mind that I'll never do that. And it's also rooted in pride because it says, you... I can believe that you would do that, but, but not I me. would never do that. There's, right. So there's a huge pride factor involved in that as well when you totally. say things like that. And that's not enough of a safeguard. What yeah. I've said is, no, the statement isn't, 
I would never do that. Yeah. The statement is, I would never want that to happen right. to me or my loved ones. Therefore, if I don't want that to happen, I think I probably need to do something to ensure it won't right. because I know my own confidence is not enough of an assurance that this will never happen. Mm -hmm. So when you think about your own life and uh, looking back on several decades, and, and, and again, as you said, you're not done yet, but things that you have continued to do, what are the things for you that have, you said, okay, if I never want to end up in any kind of like, even if it's what we would say is things that aren't uh, adultery or embezzling money, but subtle abuses of power or mm. using or manipulating others, like all of that stuff. If I never want that to never, not even, even be accused of that, but never had that to be true mm -hmm. in the relationships that I, what are some things you have put in your life mm. that have helped you safeguard uh, a place you'd never want to be. Right. And, and before I get to the specific, there's probably two principles that have worked very well. You know, we do in, 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 ga in sports games, we play both defense and offense. Mm -hmm. In hockey these days, there's kind of, there are great defensemen, but there are people who got to score goals as well. Yeah. And you need both, but ultimately offense is what wins the game, although defense prevents you being scored on. And I think when it comes to this kind of stuff, there's some defense in depth issues and then there's offensive issues. Mm. And I mean offense in the good sense of mm. the word. And defense is, I think, looking at those things that can tend to weaken your resolve. Mm. Uh, one of the most famous uh, space accidents was the 1973 Space uh, Shuttle Challenger exploding. And the main reason why that they exploded was that the night before in Cape Canaveral, the temperature dropped all of a sudden in Florida below the design limits of the O-rings that sealed the exhaust gases from the rockets from the liquid fuel tanks in there. They were now suddenly being asked to function in an environment that they were never intended to, and they failed. Every one of us has those environments in which our O-rings can fail, as mm -hmm. it were. So to become aware of what our vulnerabilities are, you know, yeah. What are the environments in which O-rings can fail mm. and take proactive measures to avoid them? So I think for each one of us to understand, so that was a very important principle. Mm -hmm. De defense alone isn't enough. Yeah. Those things are important because otherwise life will become a real drudgery where I'm always defending myself or against living attack. living in fear. Yeah. yeah. The other side is a principle of what somebody called the power of an expulsive affection. One man put it this way. He said, you can never conquer desire by denial. Most people who fall in any one of these various ways, whether it's financial or sexual or whatever, it's because they gave into some desire. They really wanted more money. They really wanted more recognition. They wanted more pleasure, whatever it was. They wanted something. And the typical way of conquering this, you must say no, you must say no, you must mm. say no. Well, it doesn't work. Mm. Ultimately, you have to say yes to something. And if you actually look at it in everyday life, that's how we function. How many of you have had children who, it's time for dinner, come on in, come to bed, and they're busy playing hockey. I'm not hungry, I'm not hungry but you force them to come in and they can polish off two whole platefuls of food. Mm -hmm. It wasn't that they denied themselves the food. They were playing hockey and they wanted hockey's pleasure much more than something else. So those two principles, I think, were first. Now, then yeah, you... And just, yeah. just to mm. finish that, this idea that you, you displace a smaller affection with a greater one. Exactly. Yeah. It actually pushes out, so it's not about denial, but a greater desire. Totally. So let's talk about that. Yeah, and so to me, uh, for, uh, in terms of... Uh, the way we have been wired to live, we talked about in the other three sessions we've talked about, is our life with God and relationships. The vertical relationship with God and the horizontal relationship with people are the pieces of the puzzle that kept me moving. And so, for example, I would say when I talk first about... Yeah, let's, do, let's, let's spend some time on both those parts. Okay. So let's start with the vertical relationship. The vertical relationship yeah. is so, first of all, as I said at the very beginning, we are transformed by the relationship in our life. Religion is so much about saying no. Don't do this, don't touch that, don't go here, do this, do that, five times a week. Religion doesn't do anything for us, mm. but the relationship does. So I have to foster that relationship. And I would say probably one of the most fun fundamental transformative practices anyone can put into practice is regularly reading God's word. Mm. Not again in a mechanical sense of the thou shalt and the thou shalt not, but the Bible is a story. It's a story of God creating his people and God in relationship with his people transforming them in them. And we read a story and we find connections between that story and our story. Even Jesus, you know, whom we as Christian believe was God incarnate, lived his life 
by connecting himself with that story so that so many times in his life he would say so that scripture might be fulfilled so that scripture might be fulfilled he didn't mean he was looking for scripture to then deliberately live by that he had a sense of a divine script that scripted his life and i would say and this is my 38th year of reading through the whole bible i've no i've never read anything else more than twice or three times at most it's a story that i continually get connected to and so i'm living out a divine script mm. in my life so i would say that was probably and still continues to be one of the most transformative practices in my life and you've said something to me before about reading is that we read not primarily for information right. but encounter right that we encounter the living god right of this story this divine story exactly. that we are a part of right. and his voice mm. is a voice that continues to speak right. one of the ways to describe the holy spirit is breath right um that is the breath of god right. actually speaking to us mm -hmm. um and and to be to have a relationship with the divine being of the universe is an enthrallment for our souls that can be like a greater affection and and that's what the, the picture that is painted there is what is this kind of a life going to do for for god no you real one of the things i learned from this big story is that god doesn't need me mm. he didn't create me and this universe and all those other things because he had some despotic need or he was bored for some <laughs> codependent people yeah, in our yeah. life and he would then make them jump through all these hoops yeah. we're used to rulers like that right despotic yeah. rulers of various countries but he was a god with no needs at all he created out of sheer pleasure mm -hmm. so that you and i could experience that joy and that pleasure so he himself becomes that enduring motivation for that greater affection in our yeah. life it is for me and not for him yeah. that gets drilled into me over and over yeah. and it keeps awakening longing and desire it's one of the things that i loved in watching your life over the years was you're different than me in that you're a very disciplined person right. Right. um I can be disciplined on things for a while and then I let go of them for a yeah. while. For you if you come across a principle you're like, "Yep, I'm going to do it for the rest of my life." Yeah. <laughs> Which is beautiful. Yeah. Uh not necessarily how I was wired, yeah. but I think what I always saw in you was not this, "Oh, he has this life with God because he prays every day." Oh, yeah, exactly. It was it was fueling your life with God. Yeah. Uh, we used to joke about you in in uh church when you'd <laughs> worship It was like they say when Jack Nicholas used to swing his golf club, he would swing like he was coming out of his shoes. Yeah. We me and my friends would joke that when you were up there worshiping, it was like at some point you were just going to come right out of your shoes <laughs> up into the, you yeah. know, that there was this desire for God that was thrilling your yeah. life. Mm. And you know, we talk about in our church that um personal practices are faith catalysts. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In a sense that these we don't do these things to earn favor with God like you said because no. God needs us to do this. Why do we read scripture? Why do we sing? Why do we gather together? Even like this online and hopefully mm -hmm. eventually mm -hmm. and some of you on today in person. It is so that we can touch the divine life in God and God in us that we can in a sense come out of our shoes in delight. That's why we practice these things. And here's something else you need to realize about the Bible if I for that was helpful. Yeah. I realized that later on that when God tells us how to relate to the Bible, mm -hmm. normally you and I think, "Oh, that's a God's word is full of words." You know, mm -hmm. so we're just reading a lot of words for information. What well, gets boring after a while? You know all the information, right? but how did god create the opening opening chapter of the bible is that god spoke mm -hmm. and something came into being mm -hmm. and then as he continued speaking that which was shapeless was given shape and that which was empty was filled so when i read the word mm -hmm. it's still that living word mm -hmm. that is creating in me what wasn't there that shapes what was shaped how often do we say oh, i'm bent out of shape mm -hmm. yes you are you and i are all bent out of shape but there's god's word reshaping mm. how i feel empty purpose says come let me fill yeah, you yeah. so you are not dealing with concepts you're dealing with a living word that creates shapes yeah. and fill this transformative yeah and i think i like i look at those personal practices in your mm. life things like reading scripture mm. prayer mm. um sunday worship corporate worship yeah. like um being with others sabbath like a weekly day a weekly uh, mm. pause mm. one in seven to pause and delight in god and remember his presence remember his goodness to rest from your work all of those things and and if you've been a part of our our community here at the well you've heard us talk about this a lot uh, over the years it is so that 
the, you are cultivating a greater affection for God that will become the greatest affection in your life that then puts all of our other desires, yeah. many of which are legitimate desires, but they put them in their right place and they, don't, they aren't able to actually dominate. So I think that's a huge thing in realizing why we do this right. and how it actually works, even in the area of temptation or you know, a catastrophe that we would want to avoid that the more we are intimate with God in the presence of God, it actually begins to become this ongoing thing that fuels. So it's a reason to come back to those practices kind of right. over Remember we've talked about G.K. Chesterton's famous course, every man knocking on the door of a brothel is really looking for God. Yeah. At first sight you may say, are you kidding? That's blasphemous. Yeah. No, it isn't. Yeah. Because sexual desire in itself was created by God. Mm -hmm. There's nothing evil in that. Yeah. There's nothing evil in the pleasure that sex brings. The problem is what C.S. Lewis called confusing first things with second things. Mm. He said, everything has value, and if you give the value that is appropriately belonging to something, everything else comes into place. So if God is first, mm -hmm. then, and sexual pleasure, the pleasure of possessing through finances, uh, the warmth that comes from someone encouraging you with good words, they all take their proper place, yeah. they don't become inordinate. But if second things become first, yeah. you lose both of them. Yeah. You lose God and you lose the pleasure. Yeah. Which is why it becomes addictive yeah. and it becomes a cruel Lord and master in your life. And I think that's why for the people of God, just as a 30-second comment on that as it relates to sexuality, in a few weeks we're actually going to be talking about Jesus' sort of beautiful but upside-down view of sex. Mm. In a culture that has said, you know, if you take this idea of first things and second things, God is the transcendent and right. our, our mm. first thing. When we say in a culture, no, he doesn't exist, transcendence doesn't exist anymore, there's no sort of supernatural thing, it's all gone. Well, sex becomes then the ultimate transcendence and the mm -hmm. orgasm becomes, you know, 30 right. seconds of heaven. Right. That in a sense, like uh, it's a second thing that has, we've made it to become a first thing. Right. And all it can do is enslave us. Then, exactly. Right? And so That's I right. think for the people of God, we say, not that we're afraid to talk about sex or even enjoy sex in the context that God has given us, but we say it was never meant to be a transcendent exactly. first thing. Yeah. God is first and he helps us understand and order all, and make sense of all of the other things um, in life. Yeah, and then the other thing that we talked about is the, the practice of uh, confession mm. is so important because the other thing that God's word does is it shows you where you are bent out of shape. And that has been very helpful as well because he puts a name on things that we try to rename it to something else. Mm. Oh, I made a mistake. I made an error. Mm. It was a shortcoming. Mm. God says, no, that came out of a twisted part of you. Yeah. You need to, but not to condemn. No, not to I condemn. want to make that, I want to reshape that. In exactly, you. I want to yeah. reshape it and I want to fill it. Yeah. You know? It's like when you name something, you've, you've preached that so well so often to mm. say, sin is not a bad word, it's a name that we give to what we all know is wrong in this world. Yeah. And once we name something, we get power. Over. Naming is power. Yeah. So when you call something what God calls it, yeah. you're actually moving massively towards reality and truth. Yeah. When you try to rename it into something else because it makes you feel better mm -hmm. about yourself, you're taking a massive step away from reality. And that is always moving towards insanity, not sanity. Yeah. And one of the Psalms that's a helpful one for me in confession, I think it's Psalm 36, where he says, you know, the fool or someone who doesn't understand, or, um, you know, is um, too, uh, they, they don't detect or hate or reject. their own sin. Right, exactly. And so it's this idea of saying, no, I don't want to be foolish. I need to be aware of things going on in the inner life. We talked about stuff that starts right. in the beginning, mm. narcissism and pride and, um, you know, uh, selfishness or unfilled desire or whatever, um, that as we acknowledge those things and let God name them, let Jesus say, it isn't just about the outward things. What's going on underneath? Right. Have you ever hated and, someone? And all these things start small, these big catastrophic failures that we want to avoid. Yeah. They are the result of a thousand small choices. Yeah. And it's much easier to say no yeah. way back at the beginning yeah. than right in the presence of something you shouldn't be doing. And, and to deal with it at the beginning. And that was the other thing I mentioned. Like Jesus, on the one hand, elevated sin in a sense of going, it isn't just behaviors, it's at the heart. Right. And yet, what did he do when we realized, oh my gosh, who's without sin? No one. That's why I have grace for you. Yeah. God, whereas yeah. instead of minimizing sin and not having any grace, Jesus invites us into this way of saying, no, you need to be honest about what's in your own heart, but there's enough grace for all that you find in there. 
in me. And it's interesting you mentioned the word grace because all these things, reading the scriptures, even with the metaphors that I've explained about connecting to the story, prayer as fueling a relationship, mm. they are ultimately at bottom line what the Bible called means of grace. Yeah. And grace we learned not too long ago was that how God gives us what we do not deserve. Yeah. So they're all giving, receiving modes. We start with grace, we continue with grace, and we finish with grace yeah, right good. to the very end. It's good. I want to pause here before we kind of wrap up the conversation, and we're going to sing a song with the band. Um, it's just, the song is called Good, Good Father. And it is just a reminder, it's a perfect way to transition to that, this idea of grace, mm. that we rely not on our goodness, but on who God is and what he is doing in our lives. And that intimacy with him is the greatest means of cleansing, purifying, and taking care of our own lives. And so would you join us as the band leads us in that song? Oh, I've heard a thousand stories of what they think you're like, but I've heard the tender whispers of love in the dead of night, and you tell me you're still pleased and that I'm never alone. You're good, good father. Do you are? Do you are?
You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways to us. You are perfect. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways to us. Well, we talked about how the, um, the vertical dimension in our lives with God is a means of grace, right? And transformation and change. But you also mentioned horizontally right. in relationships. How are the relationships or how have the relationships in your life um, been a means of grace, but also safeguards and people who have helped you along the way, in a sense, become the person you have longed to be mm -hmm. and stay away from the kind of life you would never want to sort of, sort of live. Right. How, let's talk about that. Yeah, I think uh, marriage is the, uh, mom is probably the biggest source of functioning that way. In fact, Walter Wangren calls our spouses mirrors of dangerous grace. They are dangerous because they reveal what you really like on the inside. Mm. When I say something or behave in a certain way or don't do something that brings a painful look to mom's face, mm -hmm. it's not because she's sensitive. It's because I have offended her. Yeah. It's actually a reflection of me. Mm. But they're also gracious because they're willing to acknowledge that and say, yes, honey, I'm sorry. The way I reacted showed where it was coming from. They can become means of grace. Mm -hmm. So in that way, all uh, relationships every in our relation, life yeah, can be every a means relationship of grace. can become. Yeah. If we were to look at it that way, that's yeah. why we all need some relationships in our life that can function as mirrors of dangerous grace. That's why a marriage is requires a permanent commitment because as soon as a spouse begins to function like a dangerous mirror, we want out. Yeah. We want to run from it. I remember you used to say. <laughs> You know, you, you thought you preached a good sermon until you got into bed that night yeah. and you heard the feedback from mom, yeah. you know. In fact, the joke was that if yeah. I didn't hear by 11 o'clock at night, yeah. something difficult was coming. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, uh, that yeah, hasn't changed, by the way. not throwing her under the bus. It's yeah. Just, yeah. No, but I think it's because mm. um, she loves you, right. respects you, right. admires you, and has been taught by you. And he said, is not afraid to say, right. either interpersonally right. when you hurt her, mm. or just as she observed you as a leader in the community you were in. Right saying, hey, you need to, like some of the listening stuff, I yeah. know that's what mom is so good at, is yeah. saying, okay, you need to learn how to do this, right. helping you with those things. So that's one of the relationships in your life yeah. that was a mirror that mm. loved you but was honest with you, yeah, but yeah. there were more. Yeah, I would say three particular friends that came to mind. <laughs> one was the most unlikely friendship from a man who uh, was actually saved right out of the drug culture. His mind was so fried on drugs that he could not complete one sentence in English at that time. Yet he came into this transforming relationship with Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. He immersed himself in this book that we talked about, the Bible. And in three years, his mind was so completely renewed. But the gift that God gave to him, and he's a pastor today, but the gift that God gave to him wasn't necessarily kind of the systematic teaching that I'm good at. He was prophetic. He would just speak powerfully into my life. He and I have known each other for over 30 years. They're two most unlikely friends that you mm -hmm. could ever imagine. I may not see him for a year, and the next time I get to him, if somebody were to peek into the door, I'll be sitting on this chair. He's towering over me, pointing his finger like this and talking to me. Yeah. A prophetic man. Yeah. And I can, recently I had to call him about something. I said, Miles, I'm going to tell you something. Yeah. You tell me if I'm fooling myself or not. Yeah. I just told him that. I said, am I rationalizing? Yeah. Or, because it was a difficult thing for me to figure out. And well, he, I could trust him to speak truth into my life. And that's the beauty of that. Is this yeah. someone who, uh, he would say, obviously was a big help to him. Mm -hmm. You were a big help to him. Totally. In his... But then there's no like, oh, now I can't, I can't confront you with no. things like, if you really taught me well, yeah. I'm going to hold you accountable <laughs> to those It wouldn't work things. with them anyway. <laughs> no, exactly. But I think yeah. those, those, are, those are friendships are hard to find. Yeah. But I think there are moments, right? Yeah. So the first time somebody in a friendship confronts mm. you about something, yeah. you have a choice to listen politely and then either actively dismiss them or slowly pull away or something in you says, this is a courageous person and I need this friendship in my life yeah. to lean into it. Totally. So the <laughs> other kind of friend that I had was also transformative, but the exact opposite of this young mm. man. Again, still very unlikely mm. because this is my good dear friend, Mike Wilkins, who passed away a couple of years ago. Mm. Uh, he's six foot two inch, white, blonde guy, blue eyed. Mm. I'm the exact opposite. He runs marathons. I hate running. <laughs> he's a poet. I don't know anything about poetry. 
And yet the thing that bound us together, C.S. Lewis would often say, friends have to have something to be friends about. Mm -hmm. The defining sentence of friendship is what you two. And I remember the day clear as a bell when he and I were sitting down at a dinner table after a, at a pastor's conference. And he and I got into a long conversation about how God makes men and women holy. And we both realized that we were together on this. Mm. And that's how the friendship started. Mm. Now his was a clear theological mind, but distilled through a poet, a pastor, uh, a different kind of theologian. And he and I could talk very openly. In fact, when some of these scandals happened a long time ago, well, I think when the Jim Baker scandal happened, the next time we got together, we said, Mike, how well do you think you and I would do alone with Jessica Hahn in a hotel room? Yeah. And we both came to the conclusion we wouldn't do very well. Yeah. And so we said, you and I are going to make a bond with each other. We were also alarmed and how people who had, say, fallen in this area, not that forgiveness wasn't available for them, but people were rushing to have them come back to speak. Mm -hmm. Almost as if to say, okay, now I can handle you because you're just like me. We made a commitment to each other. If everyone, either one of us ever were unfaithful, mm -hmm. that the other one would not let us get back into ministry, mm -hmm. but would do what was called the ministry of the interior, quietly praying, quietly ministering to whoever God brings. So he yeah. was that kind of a friend. Yeah. And the third friend I had was not formal at all. He actually was a very skilled person in the business world mm -hmm. who from his own background, God used to develop a calling to hold Christian leaders accountable. Mm. Do you know one day he told me, Sundar, for three nights I couldn't sleep because in a sermon I heard you say something that didn't fit with the person I knew you to be. Wow. And he came back three days later. He yeah. said, I finally figured out and I was able to go to sleep. Yeah. That, uh, I turned out good in that case. <laughs> On another occasion, he came to me and said, hey, the way you spoke to that person, that was harsh. Yeah. But he would put his arm around me immediately after that and be willing to yeah. weep with me. Yeah. Those three people, it's so good. my wife and my, those three friends yeah. were probably the four biggest influences. And I just think, you know, just as an encouragement to all of us, like we, we need that in our lives. We need to be that for each other, but we need to accept it for each other and we yeah. need to seek it out. Acceptance is so important. Yeah. And I think if I know that I'm flawed and deeply capable of, like, you know, <laughs> this is the Christian story. We are capable of the most beautiful acts mm -hmm. of grace and goodness. Um, and love, and we are capable of the most catastrophic, destructive things. This is who we are as human beings. Alexander Solzhenitsyn right, said the, the line between good and evil does not run through you know, borders or political parties, but through every human heart. And C.S. Lewis <laughs> used to say this, the higher, the lower. Ultimately, therefore, the more divine, the more demonic in its potential. Right. And yeah. he said every human being yeah. is an angel and a demon yeah, at the exactly. same time, you know, becoming yeah. one or the other. Mm -hmm. And so he said we're no ordinary beings, right, yeah. Lewis said. So I think just to recognize, okay, if I know that about myself, then I will be actually not surprised when someone comes and says to me, you screwed up. Yeah. Uh, but in, in love saying, but I'm with you. And I think this is so important. This is why long-term relationships in community are so essential. Absolutely. Because we can leave and move on and people don't know us or we don't allow ourselves or we don't invest actually in enough in people's lives to say, to even think about the church, the family of God as a place, do I like it here? Do I like the preaching? Do I like the music? You know, is there a good kids program for my kids? God, do you have a role to me to play of love and friendship in the lives of people here? I'm called to this community to be those kinds of people and to seek out those kind of friendships. And I think the other thing, just in closing to mention that I appreciate you mentioned to me, even as a, as a pastor, you know, as a senior pastor, you're accountable to your board of elders. There were a few, you, you told me this a decade ago, maybe more. There were a few elders on your board who in addition to sort of being, carrying out the role of elder, their, one of their jobs was to watch you and to, pay attention to anything they thought was concerning yeah, no question in your it. personal life, in your public life, whatever. And they had the right and the obligation actually to call you on mm -hmm. it. And that's beautiful because that's, you know, that I think is just actively saying, how can I give people active permission? So some of you may know people in your life that you feel like are, are mm -hmm. good at doing this, but you may not be saying, you know what, I think I need that. How um, can I seek it out? And so just in closing, I think uh, I want to, you know, um, just encourage you as you even see your life in this community at the well. And maybe you're someone who's a, who's a part, you know, you'd say I'm part of the family here, I'm, I'm in. Others of you are just getting to know our family uh, through uh, you know, our online services or you've been sort of maybe on the periphery and you, it's been a good place for you. Just to see even the things we've talked about here as personal practices in your life of scripture and prayer and worship coming together. 
as means of cultivating this dynamic, life-giving, life-changing relationship with God. But then also that the community of faith is meant to also be a dynamic, life-giving, life-changing community that we have a commitment to one another. And so all of the things that we encourage you to do, whether it's the daily readings online or coming to prayer meetings or coming to worship or being in a part of a home group, uh, so that you mm. can grow and that you're not meant to have to say, I have to make sure that in my life I never have a screw up no. or whatever. Yes, your life is your responsibility, but you're not meant to achieve that alone. No, exactly. That we have the great yeah. gift to give one another to do this. And I think you could say this after how many years, and I could say this as a few less, I would be nowhere without the grace of God and the community of faith. Uh, absolutely. It saved, totally. has saved my life, yeah, you know? Absolutely. So anyway, I just want to thank you for... Mm. Just the life mm. that you've lived. Mm. And I want to encourage you to finish well. <laughs> yeah. Please keep me honest. Yeah. <laughs> and you do. You do. Yeah. You should know. You should know that I go to my son regularly for input on things that he knows so much more about than I do. He's more passionate about than I am. He's more committed than I am. And so now we've come full circle and he teaches me. And I get to sit under his teaching. And not only his teaching, but under his counsel on a regular basis, you know. Yeah. Mm. So a few months from now, we'll hug it out when we're allowed to do that. <laughs> but otherwise, thank you so much for listening. Yeah, uh, God, God bless. Yeah. You were reaching through the storm Walking on the water Even when could not see and in the middle of it all we thought you were a thousand miles away not for a moment did you forsake me not for a moment did you forsake me and after all you are constant after all
Will you forsake me? Amen. Okay, church, just a couple of quick announcements before you go about the rest of your day. As I mentioned at the beginning of the service, today is Palm Sunday, and that kicks off Holy Week. That means that next weekend is Easter weekend. Um, and so we want to invite you to participate in our Good Friday and Easter services. We'll be holding them both online and in person. So if you aren't ready to meet in person with people, you can continue to engage in our worship services online. Both of those services on Friday and on Sunday will be at 10 a.m. right here on our website or on our YouTube channel as usual. But if you are ready to begin worshiping together with three-dimensional people, we would invite you. Please know that we are adhering to all COVID protocols. We would never want to put anybody at risk. But we're really excited to actually begin meeting together as a community. And so on Good Friday, we're going to hold two services at 9.30 a.m. and at 11 a.m. at our Vaughn site. That's for everyone, though. Um, at 9.30 a.m. and 11 a.m. at Cineplex at Highway 407. You can get all of that information on our website. You can also pre-register. We, we need you to do that. So if you're intending on coming, you need to sign up. And we'll be excited to um, remember and reflect on Jesus' suffering together as a community. And then on Sunday, we get to celebrate his resurrection, his triumph over death and sin. And um, yeah, it's just the best Sunday of, of, of the year. And so we're so excited to be able to celebrate together. Uh, we will be holding our service in Vaughan at 10 a.m. in person. And our service in King City will be at 4 p.m. in the afternoon. In both cases, you will need to pre-register. And so you can get that information on our website. But we really hope to see you there. Another thing that we're excited about about um, Easter weekend is the opportunity for you to egg your neighbor. It's an idea that we have to help you bless your neighbors or your friends, somebody especially that you know maybe has been um, struggling over COVID. Can you believe that we are celebrating our second Easter in some form of COVID quarantining? So our idea is for you to actually do a little bit of an egg hunt on their yard. I would suggest putting the chocolate in those plastic eggs so that dogs and stuff can't get it. And ringing the doorbell, we've given you a little sign that you can stick on there that says, hey, you've been egged. Um, and running and seeing them be surprised and, and delighted with a little bit of a, an Easter egg hunt uh, from you. We'd also in, um, encourage you to use that opportunity to invite them to um, at least one of our services over Easter weekend because we know that the joy and the peace and the hope that people are looking for is actually found in Jesus. And so this is just a really great opportunity for you to invite people um, to one of those services next weekend. Um, if you manage to tag your neighbor, I'd love to see some pictures. So um, you can share that with me. You can email them to me. I'd love to see it. Finally, <laughs> tonight is our encounter prayer night. Eat, um, on the last Sunday of every month, we have um, a prayer meeting, or uh, we call them encounter prayer nights. And whether you've prayed out loud with people before, or this is your first time, you know, ever even contemplating going to a prayer meeting, I would say, come, you are welcome. We will not put you on the spot. I promise you do not have to pray if you don't want to, but you don't want to miss an evening where you get to um, listen and learn and um, ultimately encounter the Holy Spirit in new and profound ways. And so um, we are holding our encounter prayer night still over Zoom. Uh, the information about that is, I'm sure, coming up on the screen right now. Uh, but it's at 8 p.m. tonight. It's for one hour, and we hope that you will join us. With that, friends, can I just bless you um, as you head into Holy Week with a new and deeper understanding of just how much <laughs> Jesus loves you. Go in peace. Thank you.